My name is Jill Tarter, and I'm going to introduce you to the panelists on the stage this morning. And then um, I have specific questions for each of them. And uh, just like Grace, Admiral Grace Hopper, I am begging Jamie's forgiveness because I went ahead and, and told three of the panelists that they were able to use a few short slides. So we will have a little bit of us. Uh, of uh, slides this morning, as well as questions. And I hope the audience has, has lots of uh, difficult and interesting questions for the panelists. So let me, let me start with the, um, the introductions. Directly next to me is Dr. Ian Morrison, actually Dr. Doctor. He has two PhDs, uh, the first from the University of uh, South Australia in IT, and the second from the University of New South Wales in astrophysics. He now works at the Center uh, for Astrophysics and Supercomputing at Swinburne University. Next to Ian is Tabitha Boyajian. She's, uh, her degree is from Georgia State. She did a postdoc at Yale, and she's now an assistant professor at Louisiana State. Um, and she is the science team leader for the Planet Hunters Citizen Science Project, and uh, she's put in a lot of efforts to understand the WTF star. So we'll ask her about that in a bit. Uh, next to Tabitha is uh, Dr. Alexander uh, Padoff. He's a physicist with degree from uh, Moscow State University. He's now at the uh, Skobeltsin, Skobeltsin Institute of Nuclear Physics at Moscow State University. And he heads the SETI Center of the Russian Academy of Sciences and leads the SETI observations at the Rattan 600. And we'll hear some more about that from him in a bit. Next to him is Jason Wright. Uh, Jason has a degree from UC Berkeley. And he's now an assistant professor at Penn State. He's a member of the Penn State Center for Exoplanets and habitable worlds, and I've been having lots of interactions with Jason recently about um, coming up with a, a very excellent metric for disseminating information about possible signals of extraterrestrial intelligence. Next to Jason is Lucianne Walkowitz. Uh, she has a degree from UW, University of Washington. She was a Kepler Fellow at UC Berkeley. She's now, she was a Henry Norris Russell Fellow at Princeton, and she's now a member of the astronomy program at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. She's also a very prolific artist in lots of different media. And finally, at the end, we have Beatrice um, Villar, Villaroyal, and she did her PhD at Uppsala University. She's a postdoc at ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, and she has some rather it's funny to say this, non-traditional ideas about how to find advanced technologies, if, as if there are any traditional ones. But um, the panel is, is fun and uh, very uh, expert. So let's start with, with Ian. And yesterday, you know, we heard a lot of, we heard some reports about SETI observations um, at the GBT, at Parks, at the Allen Telescope Array. Um, but they all had somewhat similar nature, right? The observations that were described. So what's missing? What, what more could we do in this arena? Well, first, an excellent session of talks yesterday afternoon. Uh, but one area that I felt deserved a little more consideration was uh, detection of wideband leakage uh, from Proxima B. So we had, we had the talk from Danny Price who explained uh, the, 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 the excellent sensitivity of the Parkes telescope to uh, strong narrowband features. Uh -huh. But uh, he made the observation that really we probably needed to wait until um, the SKA to maybe detect wideband leakage. And I, would, I don't think we need to be quite that pessimistic. Uh, we also saw from Jerry Harp's talk that use can be made of the uh, orbital dynamics of the TRAPPIST-1 system, for example, to help with this problem. So the problem with, with wideband leakage is essentially if you're, uh, you have a civilization on a planet that's generating uh, electromagnetic 
radiation across the spectrum from a distance, uh, what you're seeing is just the incoherent sum of a whole uh, multitude of different sources at different frequencies, bandwidths, polarizations, propagation paths, and so on. And, uh, what you see is just a, a essentially noise. And uh, if, you, as, if you don't have any dominant sources of signal, <coughs> then uh, from the central limit theorem, we expect that noise to be Gaussian. Uh, but also, there may be no low-hanging fruit of uh, strong narrowband sources. If, if Earth's uh, uh, technological history tells us anything. But also, uh, I think if those strong sources were there, they probably would have been found already. So we may be forced to look for uh, relatively low flux, possibly spectrally flat leakage, and that's very challenging. If you have, uh, uh, you need to do very long integration times, you could be observing for days or weeks or months. You know, the, things like the, the inherent uh, uh, gain instability of your telescope can swamp the signal, the very faint signal you're looking for by orders of magnitude. So it's very, very difficult to detect uh, very low absolute levels of flux with any accuracy. Um, but what we, what we can detect is variability. And uh, uh, in Jerry's talk, he, he mentioned the, the observations of the SETI Institute, which were taking advantage of the, of the transits. So this, instead of the light curve showing the dips in uh, as the, as planets are transiting in front of, of uh, TRAPPIST-1. Think of this as the, as, the, as the radio leakage experiencing dips as planets pass behind the star uh, in occultation. And those occultations are coming thick and fast. And that, that gives us a, a whole lot of variability. And that makes the detection easier. If you, if you were to observe um, <coughs> say the full bandwidth of your telescope for, for, for several orbital periods, and you, you fold that that data, you can improve the signal to noise in exactly the same way that the pulsar people uh, process pulsar signals for pulsar timing, and that improves the signal to noise. So I, I would suggest that something similar could be done with Proxima b. Uh, it, we, we don't expect it to be a transiting planet, but we, uh, you know, the, the key is not, is, is just that there's some variability in the RF emission, so it's not isotropic around the planet, something you've suggested in the past, Jill. Um, and for example, if, if Proxima b turns out to be tidally locked, which is quite likely, that's not a problem because, or may not be a problem, if you had a civilization uh, on a tidally locked planet, you might expect their, their activity and their radio emissions to maybe be more, more concentrated uh, near the terminator between light and dark, for example. So you might see, uh, like, as shown in this uh, graphic, if you were nearby the planet, you might actually see as, 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 an, as the orbit uh, passes, you might actually get a couple of peaks in a variation in, in, in flux, and that, that could be detected. But of course, if you're trying to detect uh, on Earth with a, uh, say, a Parkes-class telescope, you might, this is what you might see on one orbit is essentially noise. It's very hard to distinguish anything. But if you then take multiple orbits and you, you uh, combine that data, there's two orbits, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, and you start to see the signal emerge from the noise. Or more, more correctly, the noise is being suppressed by the folding. So here we have a sort of three or four sigma detection. Um, and this is, so this model, and model was for a, a, a Parkes grade telescope. And the incident flux is something of the order of uh, one microjansky, um, which is less than, less than a, a kilowatt of EIRP at, at Proxima b. So things can be done. Of course, this, we're talking about constant observing for five or six years. It's not really possible with Parkes. But I would say there's, there's a number of other telescopes uh, in the southern hemisphere that have c continuous visibility of, of Proxima and uh, could be used for this sort of experiment. I'd single one out, uh, for example, MOPRA, 22-meter uh, dish. Some of, these, some of these telescopes are undersubscribed and, uh, and approaching decommissioning, such as MOPRA is in that situation. This would be an excellent instrument. It has wide bandwidth, good sensitivity, and has the added advantage you can observe uh, in a 7-millimeter band where there's virtually no RFI. So th this could be an alternative to using the SKA. And we, the SKA will give you definitely greater sensitivity, but we're not going to have access to that for long duration observations, whereas this might be an alternative way. If we can get access to a telescope that's approaching being decommissioned, it could be used, uh, instead of being decommissioned, be used 100% observing of, of, uh, of Proxima. And uh, that's something that maybe a breakthrough could consider. OK, so we're looking, we're, we're turning these into essentially pulsar observations. We're looking for the periodicity. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah, and benefiting from, uh, from the folding and the knowledge we have of the, of the orbits of those planets. Okay, all right. So, Tabby, you've 
had a rather exciting past couple of years as you try and understand the, uh, the, the reason that this amazing star, what you call the where's the flux star, uh, what's causing the diminution of its light. And I was going to ask you, why in heck did ET ever, and megastructures ever get involved in the discussion? But you told me you were just going to point to Jason, <laughs> right? So we'll let Jason take that one. And um, I think you've got some new information about Proxima in, and the potential excess in the infrared. Do you want to make some comments about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, it, it all started with a project I kind of uh, was interested in for my own science reasons, not on this you know strange star, but I also use optical interferometry to measure the fundamental properties of stars. So this is fundamental astrophysics, and you know the purpose of of this is really you know when you're talking about exoplanets is that you really need to know your host star. And you know, especially for M dwarfs, um, we really can't model them very well. And uh, and so I was I was um, arguing that we needed to fill up these these empirical spectral libraries with the less luminous stars. And typically, these things are used for luminosity functions of galaxies and modeling them. And so they typically use the much brighter stars in these catalogs as as their, um, as their sample, but um, Proxima was actually one of the ones that was selected to go in that sample, and then it just so happened that you know this result came out, and uh, what came out of it? Sorry, this I'll get to the <laughs> the fun stuff. Is that you know we're looking at this so we can characterize it very well, and uh, and modeling the entire spectral energy energy distribution, we're not using model, we're using observations, and it turns out that Proxima has an excess in the infrared of about 20%. And this is pretty outrageous, being that it's 2017, and we're this, this is the closest star to us, and this is the first time we're able to say something like this. And it's just the fact that we actually haven't studied the most interesting stars to us, um, you know, the ones that are closest to us, in this kind of fundamental way. Um, because they're just, you know, for many surveys, they're saturated, and so you just can't get these kind of measurements. And it's, you know, it was really surprising to, for this result to, you know, fall out of something as, as simple as we just want to, you know, look at the entire energy distribution to get the radiant flux on the planet, and then this excess came out. You mean the N-STARS consortium isn't doing this as part of their study of the nearest stars? Uh, they're they're doing a census, right? So they're just counting. Yes. They're not characterizing, as, as far as I know. All right. Correct. So you're making a case the way Dave Charbonneau made a case yesterday for getting the UV spectra while we still have HST. Right. So it that be... was the beginning of it. So yes, getting the UV spectrum and also the infrared measurements, which are critical, especially to you know looking for evidence of of uh, you know astrophysical and also like you know, a natural phenomenon that, you know, occur around stars is that you would expect some sort of excess from, you know, debris disk, asteroid belt, um, you know, or waste heat, that, that sort. And the fact that we don't have these measurements for the nearest stars to us is disturbing. Well, it seems to me if the reason we don't have them is because they're so bright and saturated, can't we just use a smaller telescope? Isn't there a way to... I mean, can we turn this into a citizen science project? Uh, yes and no. Um, infrared cameras are, are pretty expensive. And um, the sample size that you're talking about is only tens of thousands. And so the return on your investment, whereas you know, if you build a, uh, a survey that can sample millions of stars, you know, if the more fainter ones that won't saturate, then you get a better return that way. And so it's not very appealing. I suppose, in that sense, as being. I don't know. We'll ask Lisa Kaltenegger whether she thinks it's very appealing <laughs> um, when we get to the audience. But I can see a certain amount of appeal of trying to very thoroughly characterize those stars that are nearest to us and which 
will undoubtedly be the attention of a lot of study in the near future. Okay. All right. Surprising. So, um, Alexander, you run the observing program at the Rattan 600, and you've had a bit of publicity this, this last year. But I know that that's not the only study that's going on in, in, the, um, uh, in your country. So why don't you tell us about what's happening? Yes. I would like to say to just a few words about the Russian observational program in SETI. Uh, the first program is uh, based on uh, space a little bit around a telescope. Uh, the head of the program is uh, uh, one of pioneers of uh, SETI, Nikolai Kardashov. The uh, space uh, uh, millimeter on telescope will be located in the uh, L2 Lagrange point. Uh, the band of the telescope will be from uh, 20 micrometers to 20 millimeters, and it is suitable to observe uh, astro engineering construction like uh, Dyson spheres. Um, there are a number of candidates to uh, such uh, astro engineering constructions now, uh, for example, for IRS observations, but a millimetron will have much higher sensitivity and will see a uh, uh, much greater number of such objects. And now the line about uh, search for evidences of life and intelligence is uh, read out to the official program of millimetron. The second program is based on multi-channel automatic uh, telescope uh, with name Multi-Mega Tortora. The head of the project is uh, Grigory Beskin. Uh, this system has large uh, field of view and uh, can record light curves with time resolution about one-tenth of a second. Um, this is uh, one telescope of the system. Uh, uh, the program is represented by systematic monitoring of se seven known Earth-like uh, planets in habitable zones. You can see the names of this object in the left column of the table. Um, uh, in the right column of the table is represented the number of 15 minutes uh, uh, re records of light curves. And you can say that now it is a rather large numbers. Uh, finally, uh, this is some development on the system with name signed. Uh, it will be represented by 470 telescopes. Uh, and the, finally, the, the third uh, program is based on Rattan 600. Uh, it is in operation since uh, 2050. 15, the head of the projects is myself, as you can see. Uh, the program is represented by a systematic monitoring of a limited list of nearby sun-like uh, stars with a good candidate society with wave lengths from 1 to 6.2 centimeters. Uh, you can see the list of the, list of the sources. Uh, 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 Rattan Shesot operates in a transition mode. You can see the number of transitions uh, measured for each candidate in 2015 and 2016, and uh, the limited of uh, fluxes obtained. Uh, the, we, we can carry out the observation in two, two different modes. One is the measurement of uh, strong signal, signals that can be seen in one measurement. Other is accumulation of uh, signals during all uh, transits. This is two examples of our uh, results from uh, accumulations in 2015-2016. Uh, Generally, we see nothing but uh, noises, uh, but you, uh, suddenly, uh, in some cases, we see real sources, but this sources is not in the direction of the, our candidates. It is uh, identified with some uh, uh, known weak uh, sources. And finally, I would like, uh, would like to know that there is one general uh, idea that uh, joins last two projects. This idea is that each set of candidates uh, should be measured not only once, but uh, systematically, because uh, a single observation produces 
uh, very little information. We don't have a lot of press interest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. All right, Jason. Um, so, how did ET become involved in the study of this uh, WTF star? Where did those ideas come from? Why did you need them? Or do we need them? And how are we going to go about organizing the community to better interact with the public and the media about interesting signals that, that we find? All right, a lot, a lot there. Uh, <laughs> so how, how did ET get involved in Tabby Star? Well, it, um, some of this comes because the, the, the sort of communication setting that we just heard about and we've been hearing about is, uh, it can feel like an impossibly difficult problem. I know you like to talk about, the, is it the nine dimensions of space that has to be searched? Right. Uh, including, you know, the rate, RA, the deck. Free space, one time, frequency, two polarizations, right? uh, modulation scheme, and uh, power. All right, so that's a huge space to look for transmissions. and. Um, and if you get one of those wrong, then you'll miss the signal, and 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 you know you'll 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 miss the fact that they really are trying to contact us. So anything that narrows that space down, I think, will you know you have a high dimensional space. Even getting rid of one or two dimensions can really focus the search a lot better. And so when I got involved with SETI, that was my contribution. Not being a radio astronomer, I thought, how can I help focus the search on likely places? So there's an old, um, you know, just as old as radio communication, going back to to Frank. And, uh, and to Coconi and Morrison's paper uh, is Friedman Dyson's idea that you might be able to detect the effects of alien industry on its star. They might build large structures, for instance. And um, this, uh, there was a paper that really struck me when I read it in 2005 by Luke Arnold, uh, who pointed out that Kepler would be a great machine for looking for large structures orbiting other stars. So Friedman Dyson had in mind that one would look for the waste heat, that you would look for excess infrared emission off of stars. Um, but Luke pointed out that, that Kepler would be able to see things if they were you know, the size of planets or larger. They should transit their stars occasionally. And that Kepler had the sensitivity to distinguish them from planets. They would not look like planets. And so I had this in my mind for a long time. And uh, I was working on a paper pointing out that if Kepler had seen such a thing, some obviously non-circular, large planet-like object crossing in front of its star, we probably would have heard about it, and so we could conclude that they must be very rare in the galaxy. And I was working on this project when uh, Tabby happened to visit Penn State to give a talk, and, uh, and she showed me this light curve. And that's when I realized that the algorithms looking for the planets were uh, not looking for, for large megastructures, and that that has to be done by eye, and that the planet hunters, the citizen scientists working on this, were the ones that needed to go looking for them, and indeed they had found this, this baffling star. And, uh, and it was, what, what really made me you know, willing to put it in the paper and say, look, you know, these might be in there, we haven't rolled these out yet, was all the hard work that Tabby did for years to figure the star out. It's, it's not just, oh, it's a weird light curve, must be aliens. It's, oh, years of work of figuring out what the star is, showing it has no mid infrared excess, showing it's an ordinary F star, showing there's no problem with the data. All of that work and ruling out all the natural explanations is what brings it up to the point that we can say, well, maybe this should be added to the, to, to the, the Breakthrough Listen catalogs, to the ATA catalogs, and, and studied better. So the, there's this other side of SETI, sometimes called artifact SETI, and the difficulty with it is that when you find something weird, you find an interesting astronomical anomaly like Tabby Star, uh, or even something that just modestly doesn't fit the, the, the models, like the mid-infrared excess that um, Proxima apparently has. Um, you know, if you want to claim that it's aliens, that's a really long road, because you have to show there's no possible explanation that it could be. Whereas with communication SETI, if you catch that narrow band signal, You've got it. There's no astrophys natural astrophysics that does that. And it will be the same thing with the leakage, that if you see low-level radio leakage, you'll try to imagine any natural phenomenon that could you know, produce that. You can't say you've, you've got the aliens until you see something unambiguous. So I see the sort of stuff that, that we might work on looking for these astrophysical anomalies as feeding the communication SETI. 
Uh, and at the same time, we're finding interesting natural anomalies, uh, you know, presumably natural anomalies, that are worthy in their own right of a lot of study. So when you raise the specter of um, alien megastructures, or ET, in this discussion of the WTF, mm -hmm. the media were instantly uh, fascinated. And they went wherever they were going to go. Oh. Could there have been a way to, um, to quantify the significance of this suggestion? Right, I th I think so. At least in a in a subjective way. Um, the there's uh, the Rio scale, which you should probably introduce. You know, can do better than than I. I think uh, a, a ten point scale that uh, was originally intended to try and give the public and the press a sense of what would constitute a really interesting SETI detection. Should we have one? Uh, and it's composed of two parts. It's the, the, the importance of the signal. You know, is it a nearby source we can communicate with? There's something extragalactic that you just know it's there and you can't do anything about. Um, but also a term of how sure are we that this is really a, uh, an alien signal. And I think it's worth looking at uh, a lot of the media blow-ups of recent signals in the past few years, uh, including, including the WTF star and the Raton uh, 600 signal. And seeing if we can have a way that, that, that experts in the field can look at it and agree on, on a number that says, you know, this is the probability that this is something the press really needs to be interested in. And something like the Richter scale or the Torino scale for asteroids, a commonly agreed upon scale, so that, you know, if we say this is a, a two on the scale and the WTF star was a three, just to throw random numbers out, that will give, you know, a sense of proportion and allow us to better communicate instead of just saying, well, it's probably not, but, you know, to give that sense. And if that could catch on, then I think that would really help uh, us communicate with the media what's an interesting anomaly versus what's a really exciting possible detection. And, and when we first developed the Rio scale in 2000, it was important that there be a zero on that scale <laughs> so that we could quickly say, this is a hoax. This is something you should not pay attention to. Yeah. And as you're finding out, when you, and now as you're trying to revise it, it's difficult to come up with a, se a series of questions or boxes to check that give you, uh, that put everything into a numerical value. But good luck. Thank you. <laughs> and so, um, Lucian, you actually spent some time looking at variable stars, wondering whether any of them were being tickled so that they were, their periods were being artificially changed. Um, so that's one kind of a strange signal, and at least that's a prediction of what might be there. But I think you're now interested in how we can use machine learning to find things that we didn't define, that we didn't think about in, the, in, in advance. Do you want to tell us something about that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, over the, the past day or so, we've had a lot of wonderful talks that uh, take what I think is a somewhat a traditional approach to SETI, trying to predict signals that we might look for, designing our experiments as we do as scientists around that. And uh, it, Jason, you just spoke about narrowing your focus and looking my eye, and I sort of do the exact opposite. <laughs> Um, you know, nowadays uh, we're moving solidly into the realm of uh, survey astronomy, where rather than doing targeted searches, we tend to collect large amounts of data, um, and that data is often in the time domain, meaning that it reveals variability. And one of the things that becomes possible is to use, when you have, you know, a fair amount of data, uh, advanced algorithms to sort out and let the data speak for itself. So with something like um, the Planet Hunters Project or Kepler, Kepler produced a lot of data, um, but not, you know, Kepler doesn't have so many light curves that one couldn't look at them within the lifetime of a graduate student, for example. Um, so, you know, traditionally, citizen scientists have been wonderful at finding um, serendipitous anomalous discoveries, new kinds of galaxies or, for example, Tabby Star. And the thing about that is that we're moving into a realm where actually looking at all the data by eye um, is no longer possible. And so the question that I deal with is how do we systematize that? So one approach to do this is um, to use machine learning. And um, some of you are likely uh, even more familiar with it than I am. Um, but to give you a broad overview, 
I, often you hear uh, uh, machine learning affects your everyday life, first of all, uh, because a lot of the recommender systems, um, for example, when you go to watch a movie on Netflix, uh, use models of your behavior. So you can either model your behavior or you can use it to apply labels um, to things, to classify things as we have seen in other astronomical surveys. But you can also use what's called an unsupervised approach uh, where you try to discover categories within your data by looking for things that are self-similar. Now in the case of, um, to make this more specific, in the case of the project I've recently been working on using the Kepler data, most of Kepler's targets are solar-like stars. So the variability is driven by star spots, stellar flares, et cetera. Um, but there are also things that are relatively rare in the Kepler data and things that are truly anomalous. So what we've been doing, um, what I've been doing with my graduate student, Daniel Giles, is to use what's called clustering. So to look at the data, to uh, use a variety of different algorithms to cluster it into things that are self-similar, and then to look for what stands out, what is rare or completely unusual. And the, the strength of this approach is that you don't have to do what um, my colleague Jeff Scargle calls psychoanalyzing ET where we don't really know anything about what another civilization that builds technology or not would do. And so while targeted searches are a, a wonderful approach because, you know, as you just pointed out with communication SETI, if you find the signal you're looking for, you have the smoking gun. Um, but we also have this ability now with the amount of data that we collect to take an approach that is uh, signal agnostic, where you don't specify what you're looking for ahead of time. And that actually has nice synergies with the discoveries of citizen scientists because you can then call the things that are unusual. Um, that allows you to do sort of, uh, you know, work a day vanilla things like clean your database and make sure that your uh, data is, is more perfect. Um, and it also allows you to put the anomalies in front of people and to speed up this process of doing the detective work that ultimately is necessary to vet any kind of signal that's really unusual. And so uh, right now we've been um, using actually Tabby Star as a proof of concept to try and apply these algorithms and then see if we can discover this currently most famous uh, astronomical anomaly in the Kepler data. So what data sets can we uh, go out and gather for you that are relevant to SETI? Give me all the data. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, one of the nice things about this approach um, is that it's, uh, it's relatively versatile, um, so much in the way that it can be applied to, uh, you know, the activity on your server to detect, you know, a, a malicious attack. Um, it can be uh, applied not only to Kepler, but to things like tests to uh, speed up this process of discovering unusual things in the data. And ultimately, I, I work on LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and um, one of the things that I'm hoping to do is when we have you know, a 10-year-long survey of multiple visits across um, the entire visible sky, uh, that's a, a thing where we're hoping to find surprises, um, and it can be applied there. I was actually lamenting um, to David Catling this morning on the bus that I will probably, uh, unless the singularity happens, I'll probably be dead by the time there's enough planet atmosphere spectra to do this, but it's something that you can do with spectra, too. Um, so it's not just light curves. Uh, it could be images. It could be um, spectroscopy. It's, re it's really quite versatile. It could be um, data from the radio looking at the TRAPPIST system. Yeah, it could be optical. I've been working with optical data because it's what I'm most familiar with, but it could be something like IR data. It could be radio data as well. Okay. So I was very happy to hear about the um, machine learning for SETI challenge. Great. You, I hope you join the code challenge. Um, so we've, we've been talking about variability as a, uh, as a marker potentially for technology, but Beatrix, you've, you've been thinking about a particularly extreme version of variability, and um, you're, you're actually wondering about whether stars disappearing might might be a form of SETI observation. So why don't you tell us about that? Just first question, how do I change slide? Is it the green button? The green goes forward, the red goes back. Perfect. So, um, so we have been thinking about, like, how can we try some new approach for database SETI? So, like, one problem that when one is doing this artifact SETI, and let's say looking for Dyson spheres, is that uh, very often this infrared emission can be confused with, let's say, dust signatures. And, um, 
So if one wants to kind of look for uh, uh, CT signatures in big data sets, maybe one can try something else and um, something that could be sort of cleaner or easier to deal with. And one thing would be to not look for possible effects of um, astro engineering, but let's say impossible effects for con conventional astrophysics, like something that would be so absurd that you know that, okay, either it's an error in the database or it must be some sort of new weird phenomenon that we didn't anticipate before. And um, so we have been particularly thinking about, let's say, how about vanishing stars? And then I don't mean something that becomes subluminous, but something that would, let's say, entirely vanish. So let's think about the natural causes for um, a vanishing star. So there are some um, supernova that might fail in the sense that they kind of don't become bright, but they kind of almost directly collapse into black holes and uh, that are hypothesized. And um, like the hypothetical failed supernova, one usually calls them. And uh, so far they haven't found any uh, confirmed candidate of a failed supernova. But the estimate is that in the Milky Way, it could happen maybe something like once every 150, once every 300 years. So it's a very, very rare phenomenon. So what could otherwise be the, um, let's say, the non-natural causes? Well, just fill in with all kind of science fiction explanation from wormholes to uh, new exotic physics. So we kind of tried this. We compared a uh, US Navy database that has kind of epoch data or from um, 1950s, 1970s, and we looked at all data that existed in both epochs and compared to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so maybe like two decades in between. So did we find something? We found an extremely sad candidate that we couldn't really exclude. Um, now there is no pointer, so I can't really point to it. You can see. Um, So you can see here a, a star um, that was like in both uh, use now epochs, both in the 50s and 70s scene, that in the Sloan is no longer there, which means that if it's variable, it must have fallen more than three magnitudes. So it's a very sad candidate in the sense that it could be just noise that happens to be there twice at the same place. So I think we can do much better than this. And um, so the mission now that we will try to do is to do a full-scale project where we'll, we'll compare the use now uh, to the latest data like Gaia and Pan stars because Gaia is very, very nice in the sense that for one billion stars, we are going to have uh, 70 detections for, like at different times during five years. And especially if they extend the Gaia mission for another five years, we'll have something like 140 or so. And uh, in the previous trial, we just looked at something like 10 million objects uh, that had no proper motion. And now we wanted to really extend it to 1 billion with the latest and best possible data. But also, if we think of it, if, if an object vanishes now in the, in the sky service, let's say like in the IPTF or in the Gaia, nothing is going to record it. This data is totally lost because almost all these kind of transient sky surveys look at things that appear while things that disappear are not recorded, it's probably not going to be in any way noticed. So we want to actually develop automatic detection of these vanishing, yeah, vanishing objects. And um, also kind of think about other impossible effects for, um, like, to look at also with the deep learning approaches like Lucy was mentioning. So, because all the data exists here, we have all the data, the instruments exist, we just now need to try to focus on objects that have previously been ignored, or events that previously have been ignored. And um, like, finally, I just, so what are we going to get out of it? Well, uh, we're going to find pro hopefully something interesting, let's say maybe some CT target, maybe also new and rare astrophysical phenomena and extreme outliers and, uh, I hope that we will find some objects and not just noise. Okay, looking for the unexpected. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who, who kept uh, well to time. I want to spend, we're going to turn this over to um, the audience in five, in five minutes, but the last five minutes, I have, I have two questions for all the panel, all right? First question, yesterday, I think it was Danny Price who said, blaming you again, Jason, that the uh, uh, Breakthrough Listen is the Apollo program of uh, SETI. Maybe you look surprised, and maybe it wasn't you. 
But that made me uneasy. Yeah, it's great, it's a big push, but Apollo ended and we never went back to the moon or haven't yet. So how do we keep that from happening to SETI? How do we keep this effort and all of these new ideas that you've come up with? How do we keep that going? That's my first question. And the second question is re-looking at Arthur Clarke's third law. So Clark told us any sufficiently advanced technology, and SETI is a search for extraterrestrial technology, really, any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. More recently, Carl Schroeder, a philosopher, has suggested that any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. That is, if you, if you are going to survive for a long time as an advanced technology, you're going to have to manage your planet perfectly. So it might be hard to discover that or not. I have some ideas. And finally, I think Nick Bostrom might have said he'll be indistinguishable from paper clips right? <laughs> or garbage, right? That you'll have uh, a super intelligent single, singleton with some goal and it will transform everything to achieve that goal. And so those two questions, how do we keep the Apollo SETI program from ending? And how do we think about um, what we should be looking for? Is it magic, is it nature, or is it paper clips? Okay, Lucien, brave. You know, if, um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I, I now have a new nightmare, which is that the aliens are the clippy uh, paper clip <laughs> assistant from Microsoft Office. Um, <laughs> I want to address your, uh, your first um, question, Jill, uh, which is, you know, how do we keep this push going? Um, you know, I, I was just saying to Jason right before this uh, panel started that it's really nice to be in a room full of people where we could talk in the same breath about um, what you might call vanilla astrobiology, uh, where we're talking about um, biosignatures that are constrained by chemistry and physics um, that are things that we can predict and model and that we could look for and interpret, but also talking about the searches for advanced, technologically advanced life. Um, because you know, I think we've labored under, um, you know, for many years, this uh, sort of fringiness of being somebody that works specifically on SETI. And um, you know, that is harmful to the community in that there's nothing that is intrinsically more legitimate about looking for microbes than there is about looking for advanced life, um, especially when you yourself are sitting there as a civilization that builds telescopes. <laughs> to, to just look for microbes doesn't make any sense. Um, so the fact that uh, looking for advanced life has suffered under this um, sort of stigma I think has prevented people from really devoting a lot of effort, um, whether it's people power, or whether it's funding, whatever it happens to be, um, it sort of kept us off in the fringes. And by, you know, while we do need to talk about how we communicate with the media and how we communicate with each other about interpretations of signals that, you know, could be kind of out there, um, I think that acknowledging that it's a possibility and then talking about it and having it not relegated to the fringes is a really important part of it maintaining the momentum it has. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in? Uh, I, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, comparing this to the Apollo mission is, is, is great because the Apollo mission did go to the moon. And so, you know, having to end it after that, like, you know, like you, you take your losses, you know, for whatever <laughs> reasons that is, like, I mean, it was successful. Like that was Apollo's mission was to, you know, put people on the moon. And the fact that, you know, we did that and it was successful, you know, we moved on to the next phase of, you know, space exploration, you know, even though it wasn't out of low Earth orbit, you know, it's still, you know, the next phase. And so comparing it to the Apollo mission is, I think that's a good thing. Okay. Those of us that were, are very much older than you are would have expected us to be boldly going you know, around the solar system by now. So some of us are disappointed okay, that so, we didn't yeah, get Okay, so disclaimer, I've, I've, I haven't been alive to see anybody on the moon. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, all right. With, so so magic, magic, nature, or paper clips? Yeah. So I, I would comment, uh, I, think, I think comparing uh, advanced technology with nature is a very good uh, metaphor. I mean, 
we're already seeing that with earth technology and communications that uh, advanced communication signals look more and more like noise uh, for, for efficiency reasons. And uh, this is the motivation in my, my work in, in conventional communication setting to, to expand beyond looking for narrowband signals. That's a very specific choice, uh, uh, looking for something that's clearly non-natural. But what we need to, I think we need to be looking, extending um, and, and considering signals that, that look like nature, look like noise. And that, of course, creates challenges because the more the signal look, looks like noise, the harder it is to confirm that it is, isn't nature. So we have to come up with ever more clever techniques to, to uh, differentiate between artificial and natural. But the first step is to find those, those signals, and, and then we, that's a good problem to have then to try and decide whether they're, they're artificial or natural. OK, anyone else want to make a comment? Well, I was thinking a little bit, for instance, um, we are probably looking for magic uh, in, in the vanishing survey. Um, but let's say if we find a candidate and that's of something that has vanished, something that we, it's quite easy to do, um, let's say, it's quite easy to do a follow-up observation with a much larger telescope and actually see if it's just a very variable object or if it's really, it's entirely gone. Um, and if one eventually would find that it's just a variable object, I think it's uh, very exciting also for conventional astrophysics then because then you find some record breaker, AGN maybe. I like AGN a lot, so. And uh, I think it, it also can bring a lot of useful uh, astrophysical like knowledge um, even if one maybe doesn't think about it first initially when doing the study, that it could lead to it. Okay. All right. I want to open the session up to the audience participation, both um, verbal and physical, with these wonderful <coughs> microphones. But actually, I'd like to start by asking Svetlana a little, to join in to this uh, conversation that I was trying to get started. You're talking about measuring surface features on, um, on exoplanets. So if you're managing your weather, your climate, your, your, your planet, could something like you're talking about detect an absolute lack of change in latitudinal conditions? Might someone decide to husband their planet in such a way that uh, things get much more uniform than you would expect naturally? Uh, yes, that could be detectable. Um, and in principle, these large-scale features, which uh, result uh, as a intelligent activity, let's say we have highways, network, you know, and it can be like tubes or whatever, pipelines, uh, of a large scale, they could be also detected on the surface if they have peculiar properties, reflecting properties. Or uh, large solar panel installations like we try to do now, covering the deserts by this, uh, that would be also possible de uh, detectable. Anything which uh, d kind of differs from natural forms, we'll try to find. Uh, find. Talking about this um, smooth distribution in latitudes, that could be uh, confused uh, with clouds in a way, but if it has a sharp edge, let's say it's a smooth only in one hemisphere and it's just sharp uh, con um, and uh, at certain latitude, then it will be like looking at, as a cup, then that would look pretty artificial, I would say. So okay. you can dis distinguish it from clouds. So you need some sharp edges kind of to distinguish it from uh, natural Okay, I was thinking actually of a lack of edges, that there were no poles. They, they actually made it nice and, you know, benign to live <coughs> over the whole for the surface. Well, that could be just imagine half of the <coughs> is an ocean and then it's a smooth. Okay. So that is, uh, can be confused. All right, thank you. The next question is over here and raise your hand and Svetlana will throw your. So you have a question over there. Yeah. So James Giesch at Harvard. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, based on uh, Jason's comment on uh, heavy star, uh, based on this uh, Arnold paper. So the Arnold paper was talking about uh, looking semaphores, basically, was uh, deliberate communication from the species in question. And making a semaphore is actually pretty easy relative to, say, capturing all the light from a star in like a Dysonian type 
uh, situation. In fact, we could almost make a semaphore system ourselves with current technology, plucking out, say, a few percent of the star's light. Um, the question is, uh, for Tabby star, since it is sort of order unity dips in the light curve that you're seeing, this indicates a very high level of technology, whereas maybe someone who's trying to do deliberate communication would be doing something more benign, something uh, sort of fiddling with the few percent level. So does that kind of figure into the scale of how plausible this is to be a uh, artificial signal, uh, the sort of uh, level of civilization that you would need to actually be able to do this? Um, I don't know. Um, if you're going to build very large things, planet-sized sails or screens, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that that would be part of some kind of self-replicating process. That, that it's something that you know grows exponentially some self-replicating thing that takes apart asteroids or something. Um, and so I it's possible. I all the, the socks that we've lost in all of the washing machines. <laughs> <all of them. laughs> That'd be a great screen. So um, especially once you're freed from gravity and you're in orbit, um, it's possible you're material limited. That if you just let these things go, they'll make them bigger and bigger. Um, so I don't know. Um, I mean, naively, I'd say yes. If it's bigger, it's harder to make. Um, but I don't know. Once you're building things the size of planets, I'm not sure. It's true that Luke's paper um, the, the basic idea behind it was, if there's something out there, you'll see it. But that's right. He had a lot of very specific ideas about how communication might be transmitted using those. Um, but I think the idea extends regardless of what the purpose of structures would be. Okay. Steve, you're over here. And Question. Do you throw the, the microphone to somebody who has their hand up over there? Question from a viewer of the uh, online uh, live stream, at what point do we give up on SETI? How many null results are necessary to reasonably conclude that there are no ETs out there? Let me uh, take a crack at that, and it isn't, and it, the answer is not anytime soon. Uh, when SETI turned 50, I did a calculation. I took the nine dimensions that, that uh, Jason mentioned for the cosmic haystack. I said, let's put that nine-dimensional volume, let's set it equal to the volume of the Earth's oceans, and how much of the ocean have we sampled in 50 years? And the answer was about one 12-ounce glass. So we really haven't probed the uh, question very hard at all. Now, the great thing is that we can build bigger glasses and dip them in the water faster at an exponential rate. And so, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about thinking about null results when we've sampled uh, half the ocean, let's say. I, I think a lot of the public grossly overestimates how, how much SETI happens. It has a much bigger profile in the media than you know, proportional to the work that's done. And I think they imagine that NASA has this gigantic SETI program that's searching every star all the time. And, and I think that's where a lot of this comes from. So to great. the streaming audience, we're going to make that very clear <laughs> through an advertising. There is no very large NASA project searching no. everything. There are wonderful efforts like the Breakthrough Listen and the work that we're doing at the SETI Institute and other um, observations. But it is very small compared to other types of investment in exploratory science. Can I, if I can come back to your first question, the answer for how we maintain this and perhaps make it part of the national research portfolio is you in this room and your colleagues. Ultimately, the direction of science in the US is peer-reviewed. I mean, it's at the proposal level. It's at the, the white papers that go to the decadals. It's to the people who testify before Congress about the direction of science. And if SETI is going to be part of the portfolio, it will be because we advocate for it and not just the small number of people working on SETI, but the rest of the people in the field. And so that, that, that can happen, and it will happen, but it will take the community to say, yes, this is part of the portfolio. Great. All right. Someone has my, oh, Ron, you have a microphone. Uh, Ron Hickers, uh, CSIRO Australia. Um, this is a question for Lucian. Um, as some of you may know, I've always been a great advocate for searching for the unexpected. Just look in the time domain. We have discovery of pulsars, discovery of gamma ray bursts, and now discovery of uh, fast radio bursts, all completely unexpected. 
talking about SETI, the reason for looking for the unexpected is even stronger. But my question is, when you actually look at how these discoveries were made, it requires not only an open mind and that you're looking for the unexpected, but the m most likely unexpected is some instrumental failure of some kind. And so you need the wisdom uh, of the knowledge of the instrument that's making the observations. And what worries me is how do you incorporate that in citizen science where the instrument is completely removed or even in machine learning where I don't know how you would embody that knowledge in your machine learning. That's a great question. Um, I, I think I, we're not talking about doing anomaly detection that is totally with humans out of the loop. Um, and even when we talk about citizen science, you know, certainly a lot of the work uh, on Voyage and Star involved a certain tabby Voyage. Um, and so there is a, there is a synergy between, um, you know, citizen scientists working with professional astronomers who do have intimate knowledge of the instrument. Having said that, um, certain kinds of instrumental anomalies, as I'm sure you're aware, are, are sometimes also self-similar. Um, and so, you know, if, for example, you, you take kinds of um, events that happen in, in Kepler, so my, my favorite of these because of the name um, is Argobrightning, um, which is named for a guy named Vic Argobright. Um, it's believed to be a, a little micrometeoroid collisions with the spacecraft that create these brightening events. Um, so those are things that appear over and over again in your data if you have enough of it. And that means that, yes, you're always going to find junk um, in looking for weird things because junk looks like weird things. Um, but if you do it enough, you might end up with categories. Um, so th things that were once perhaps an isolated event in your first pass and then as you observe more, you end up with categories where you're like, oh, I know what this is now. I can apply a label to it. This is an argobrightening event, for example. Um, so, you know, I think that we'll, we're never going to take the, the role of having intimate knowledge of the instrument out of it, um, but that can work together with approaches that can speed up our ability to find things that are unusual. And also, cleaning your database is great. It's, you know, like all cleaning, it's not very glamorous, but <laughs> um, it's necessary if you want, you know, things like pure samples of other kinds of um, astrophysical uh, objects, whatever it happens to be. So, Tabby, when you were working with uh, Planet Hunters, um, did advocates of particular events uh, really get excited and were they able to dig down and ask the questions about the instrumentation? Uh, yeah, our users have variable skill levels. And um, when, you know, this signal came up, it was on the discussion boards and stuff like that, and uh, some of the more skilled users, you know, were able to dig into the target pixel files and do some preliminary checks on whether or not, you know, this weird looking thing was actually real or if it was something, you know, wrong with the analysis pipeline at, at some level. And, um, and, you know, oftentimes, you know, they come to the science team and they say, hey, this is kind of weird, what's this? And most of the time it's like, oh, you know the answer or it's bad data, right? And everybody's reaction when they see this star is, you know, the, you know there's something wrong with the data and that was my reaction too, but it wasn't for like the insisting of, you know, the citizen scientist who spotted this and, and did these preliminary checks that um, it would have been thrown back into the mix and not paid attention to for, you know, all of eternity basically because we have this bias of what stars do and the fact that this star was doing what stars don't do, you know, we just, we would dismiss it and not look any, any further into it. Okay. So there's a question, yeah, you have a question. Ian, probably uh, directed to you. Um, so to recap, you, you, at the beginning you said there was this idea that uh, if, if you looked at variability in, in kind of the, the power curves for the, you know, flux, that were locked or synchronized with orbit um, for a tidally locked planet, that, that could be an interesting indicator. So that, that struck me because, as, as you know, we are working on, on power flux you know, analysis for occultations, but if we're going to scale this up and, uh, in terms of the analysis we're doing on the IBM systems, we want a lot more targets. So that, that's interesting because now you're not dealing with just the perfect inclination scenario uh, um, systems. The, the question is, though, uh, 
terms of the observations to make this compelling, with an occultation, you got kind of, let's say, a two-hour window. You know when it's going to be, whereas a, a full annual cycle, that's a lot of observation time. Were you proposing kind of spot observations, which you accumulate over time, or how, how could we scale this up? It's a great idea. I just wonder how we could scale it. Yeah, sure. um, good, good question. I mean, fundamentally, before you see a signal, you don't know where it is. Um, but if, if you have some clues from the orbital dynamics of the system, you can take advantage of that. And that's what the SETI Institute are doing uh, with, with Jerry's work. And, uh, and I'm suggesting you could, you could do the same thing. So as we, as we learn, we discover new systems, planetary systems, and we learn about their orbital dynamics, we can then factor that in, into the process and potentially uh, concentrate our observations on those periods of time when we ex well, not expect, but we think that there is a higher probability that we might see something. But in general, I mean, we don't know with, uh, for example, with uh, Proxima B, we, I don't think we know the inclination of the orbital plane. So the strength of the signal I was talking about earlier is it, it varies with, uh, you know, the orientation of the system. So we have to make as, as few assumptions as possible, really. And so um, it may be that for certain types of detections, we have no choice but to just observe continuously. And that may be impractical. So uh, I agree but, uh, that it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, but I think the more we learn about new systems, uh, the more we're able to tailor our observations to, to take advantage of that knowledge. And so hopefully we can, we can make sensible programs that don't require uh, excessive resources, because that's always going to be an issue for SETI. Okay. Graham, would you pass the microphone to Martin Rees? And then... Um, uh, Martin Rees, Cambridge. Um, we've heard about uh, possible unexpected signals from Beatrice and Lucerne. Um, I wonder if the panel would like to hazard a guess on how likely it is that we would detect a signal first from a planet around a nearby star, rather than something quite different. I mean, to give a counter-argument, if we take... The, uh, Civilization on Earth, as an example, there have been four billion years with nothing artificial detectable, then maybe a century or two when it would be. And if we look ahead, then maybe within a century or two, the machines will have taken over. Maybe they don't want to be on a planet at all. They don't want gravity. They don't want an atmosphere. So the billions of years of the future will be um, electronic entities away from planets. And so that suggests to me that perhaps the best bet is that there would be some uh, artificial emission, maybe a burping or malfunctioning of some machine rather than a message, but coming not from a planet at all. And so I wonder if the panel members would like to sort of venture any betting odds as to the relative likelihood of a signal from a planet versus something very unexpected, which uh, is artificial, but something freely floating in the universe somewhere. Uh, you, uh, I've always been interested in uh, the idea of searching for intentional transmissions or, or uh, malfunctioning uh, transmissions because then there's scope for finding signals uh, across the entire galaxy if they're tailored to, to come to reach us with, uh, with sufficient power to be de detected and decoded then then that can be tailored to, and those, so th there could be sources anywhere in the galaxy or indeed other nearby galaxies. And that opens up the, t the target space enormously. So although we've talked uh, uh, in this uh, conference about uh, detections nearby, I think we all understand that the, the, the odds of uh, there being something, uh, you know, serendipitously this, this close in, in, in our time frame is very low. So anything we can do to to broaden the, the, the target space is, is got to be a good idea. So I would, my, my bet would be that our first detection probably uh, won't be nearby, but it might be somewhere, for example, uh, in the, on the galactic plane near the galactic center, where the, we know the density of uh, civilizations is likely to be higher. Um, and we just have to hope that they, their astrobiologists have identified the Earth as a potential candidate um, target and that they, they that deliberately transmitting to us, and we will find a signal uh, that way. But it does rely on cooperation with ET, whereas searching for leakage has the advantage that, uh, uh, that we don't have to cooperate with. Part of the search as well, yes. But of course, it may not be a directed transmission. It could be something which is 
uh, just artificial but not aimed at us at all. Yes. Uh, Martin, can I do that? Uh, I just wanted to respond to your question. So I, um, I'm a big fan of sky surveys. As you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether you should do targeted searches. And what we're learning today is that the original targets we, or yesterday we learned that the original targets we thought like G stars, maybe that's not the right target. So I think there's a discussion about, <coughs> I think what you're suggesting uh, that we don't think maybe things will be near stars or near planets. That's another reason to do sky surveys. But another reason is that we don't know luminosity function of ET. And so you can argue till you're blue in the face what the luminosity function is, but it could be that the first time we find ET will be in a distant galaxy. And uh, it could be similar to the luminosity function of stars. And, and so my kind of philosophy is you ought to do a lot of different things, and sky surveys is one of the important things you should do. I'm not saying we shouldn't do targeted, but I think you ought to split your telescope time half and half. Well, actually, Martin, I think what you're pointing out is the idea that we had way back in SETI 2020, and it's just now beginning to be uh, acted on, and that is you really want to monitor all the sky all the time at all frequencies. It's not an easy task, but good. But we're, uh, we're beginning to, to see efforts. Shelley mentioned one. Uh, Elliot Gillum at the SETI Institute has another idea. I'm sure there are others out there, but that's really the goal, in case we're totally wrong about where we should be looking. All right, there's a question way back there, and then I think you've got one from the audience. Hi, uh, <coughs> Dario Robledo, uh, artist in residence at SETI and a breakthrough message. I was, Lucien, I was curious as an artist, uh, has this informed any of your strategies? Uh, in the kind of outside the box thinking you're talking about. And then maybe more broadly to the, to the panel, I, I wonder if anybody wants to speak to the role creativity plays in your, your, your life as a scientist. And you know, sometimes we make this false dichotomy between the poetic and reason, uh, but, and I'm so for blurring them together. And I loved what you were speaking about as, as making it beyond metaphor that it could have a practical purpose in the way you search through information. So I'm really big believer that the arts can have a role in a practical and a metaphorical way. So I don't know if any, because as, as an artist and poet often uh, invested in this topic, and Jill's words in particular have just as made my heart soar as much as my brain tickle. And I wonder how, how day to day, dealing with such deep, profound existential questions, are we alone? How, how do you manage that in your own life, just as a thinker, but also in your practice? There's a few questions in there, but at the heart, it's about art. Lucien, you want to start with that? Sure. Um, well, I, I guess I'd start by saying that um, the vast majority of the art I do isn't actually directly about science. Um, I have done some work at the intersection. Um, so for example, uh, when Gibor Basri and I were working on um, stellar variability in Kepler, I experimented a lot with sonification of Kepler-like curves because your ear is very good at picking out um, changes in pitch. And that's a way of, if you take Kepler's visible light data and turn it into sound, you can pick out differential rotation um, if you do it properly. And, and that actually, although it was born out of data analysis um, became a, a sound installation of Kepler-like curves for giving people sort of a primary experience of data instead of something presented to you in a, you know, an environment like the Adler Planetarium where I am, where uh, it's much more um, explained, you know, there's a plaque, et cetera. Um, I, I would say just to uh, address creativity um, that there is definitely a lot of uh, overlap, I think, um, you know, we've, we show these pictures of planets as though you know we've already taken pictures of planets, mm -hmm. but there's really a lot of um, visualization of you know what might life might be like, Im imagining these environments. Um, Jason has this wonderful quote in his thesis about planets as places, and Carl Sagan, of course, said that too. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, creative thinking and um, thinking about exoplanets as places um, that comes into play. Beatrix. Yeah. Well, I could also answer 
Um, so uh, art has a very important place in my life. For instance, uh, I have a piano violin duet. My pianist is sitting there. She should ask him to play Rachmaninoff sonata for you later. <laughs> and um, so, uh, for instance, um, there are a number of pieces like that were sent with the Voyager that I really love, like the Beethoven string quartets. So I was practicing the string quartets, and um, at the same time as we were doing this, uh, the Vanishing Star uh, study, like the first, the pilots. And we had 300,000 images to look through. So I can say that it took quite a lot of Beethoven, Brahms, and Bruckner to get through, uh, watching through 100,000 <laughs> images by eye. But it keeps you very peaceful, and it kind of, I think, I, I, I think in many ways, I wouldn't say that uh, science inspires my art. I would rather say that in many ways, art inspires my science in the way that I think intuition has a much larger role than, uh, than uh, like for selecting the paths that one uh, anticipates originally. Anyone else on the panel want to comment? I would say that SETI, more than almost any scientific endeavor I can think of, requires an open mind and creativity. And I would endorse the idea that a good scientist is a creative scientist, that it's not at all antithetical, it's, it's essential. Actually, the reason that we have an artist in residence program at the SETI Institute is because I think um, at least visual art is one of those ways that we can think about life as we don't yet know it. Um, there are some things that just look biological, even though they, they had no origin in that, in that context. It just makes us be able to not shy away, well, how the hell can we look for what we don't understand and don't know about? I think it's a very good um, way of expanding our, our, create, our, our possibilities. Shelly. Yeah, in the back. Who has the, well, let's go to the back. Right? And, and while you're walking over there, unless you want to continue on that theme. Are you continuing on the theme of creativity? Uh, not quite. <laughs> OK. Let's then, and then I told Steve that we could take a question from online. And uh, we'll yeah, get so, back to um, that. Keith Cowing, who's watching online, says, uh, you're all talking about listening for signals for alien from alien civilizations, but all SETI researchers, or I guess many of them, uh, seem to be afraid of sending out messages for other civilizations to hear. And if everyone out there is equally afraid to send messages, why do you expect to hear anything from them? All right. So if, if everybody's listening and nobody's transmitting, it's not going to work real well. Yeah. Um, does anyone on the panel want to tackle this topic? Yeah. Um, I don't know that, uh, that I would characterize everybody who is hesitant to set out um, SETI signals as afraid. Um, I know certainly there's a lot of caution, you know, like doom and gloom, the aliens will come and take our resources and take over our planet, et cetera. Um, stuff, you know, particularly I think Stephen Hawking is probably the most quoted um, in that regard. I, one of the things that I have hesitancy about is that um, signaling from our planet is something that is possible to do by a small group of people, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it should be done by a small group of people. Um, the, the fact that anybody who decides to signal out into space speaks for the planet as a whole means that it should be fundamentally an international um, and broad-based topic of discussion before the, the message or signal is sent. Um, now I realize the horse is a little bit out of the barn on that one, but um, that doesn't mean that, um, philosophically speaking, a small group of people should elect to speak for the entire planet. Okay. So there's reasons to be hesitant that are not related to being afraid that aliens will come Okay. Please come, aliens. So I'll watching <laughs> Facebook Live. <laughs> I'll give my answer to that question, and then I'll turn the floor to Dan. We're timer. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how to look at all the sky all the time, all frequencies, because that's what you need to do. Turn that around and think about if we were trying to transmit all of the time, uh, which is kind of what you have to do if your signal is going to have any chance of being detected. We can't manage very well five-year plans. Sometimes we can get through two-year plans. I think for our species to take on something that should be a 10,000 or 100,000-year plan is a really is a bit presumptuous. 
and that we should wait until we grow up and can manage that kind of activity, and then we should do it. But Dan, you, I'm pretty sure you have another answer. Uh, so throw it, come on. We want to see some. Oh, God. Ah! <laughs> nice rebound shot. Uh, so uh, I, I, as you guys know, that this thing about whether we should transmit and what we should transmit is very controversial. I think most people think it's not a good idea. Um, and uh, there are risks involved. It's very hard to assess those risks. We're an emerging civilization. My personal feeling is that we should be listening at first and s try to see what's out there. We're just, as Jill pointed out, we've done very little listening. We're young and primitive. We're just learning how we might communicate with other civilizations if they're out there. Maybe in a thousand or a million years, if we don't find anything, we should think about transmitting. The, uh, and I agree that uh, this question of who should speak for Earth, it shouldn't be just a small group doing it. You, you really want to make it a, if you're going to do it, it should be up to a large group of people from different nations and different fields. It shouldn't be just a bunch of scientists. Um, and uh, I think there's an example of when you're doing risky uh, stuff, how you should proceed. The, the people that do v work on viruses and smallpox and, and uh, HIV and people that do uh, bioengineering with CRISPR and stuff have decided have worked together. To f there's an Acelomar process where you think about the risks and the potential benefits. Um, but even if you think the risks are small, well, if you, if you think the risks are one in a million that ET is going to come and eat us, uh, that's essentially, if you do that experiment, on average, you're killing seven or 8,000 people. <laughs> and if you think the risks are one in, sorry, if you think the risks are one in a million, but if you think the risks are one in a thousand, you're killing seven million people on average when you do that experiment. So even though the risks are small, there are a lot of people on this planet. So you got to think carefully about this. Agree. We need to think carefully. I think there's a question in the back. Yes. Hi. Yes, uh, Duncan Forgan, University of St. Andrews. This is more of an, an advert slash open call to the room. Um, and it's in relation to what Jill and Jason were talking about earlier about revising the Rio scale. Um, so myself, uh, Jason and Jill are working on a paper uh, to publish a new scale. Um, we're interested in getting the community's views on how the scale should look, because if this thing's going to work, then anybody in this room should be able to look at a signal that's being produced by a different team um, and be able to assign a reasonably similar score. So it's really important that we get your views on exactly how the scale should look. And that at the end of the day, we can all use the scale to rate each other's work as well as rate our own. And that's going to be a great way for the public to get a real sense of how to calibrate their expectations when they see a new story. So if you are interested, please come and see me or Jason or Jill, uh, and we can tell you a lot more about what we're doing. Let me be a bit more proactive. Would, how many of you would object if we asked the Breakthrough Listen folks to send you a piece of email on the opportunity to try and help us rework the scale? If there are, are there strong objections? I don't want to violate anybody's privacy, but I, so expect that. I, I'll ask the, the foundation to distribute some preliminary work, and it would be interesting to get your feedback. All right, who has the mic? Over here. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, just, it, it was good. They formulated the question because it's more or less what I wanted to ask. <laughs> but also, in a sense of, of doing an experiment, um, just listening, and this is what we do in astronomy usually, and we are used to remotely observe things. I think the communication exercise is also, um, it's also a, a different um, paradigm in the sense that we send something and we try to actively interact with uh, astronomical objects. And there are um, even, I don't know, possibilities of trying to see reflected um, signals just going back. So we send something with Arecibo to proxima, no, approximate the southern hemisphere. And I don't know, something like this, some laser signals, doesn't need to encode any information at all. Something that, um, for example, we could expect the feedback that we could measure eventually, things like this. So if we, so if we see, for example, a signal from AT, it is civilization, the most natural thing to do is to respond with the same language, right? So um, we should be, I think it's just as, a, as an experiment, do something that we, for example, we would eventually detect ourselves if we were looking carefully. Just beaming something for 10 seconds um, from a, a radiant antenna is not going to be very effective because if we, saw, if we saw that in another star, we'd be probably confused or 
would be a very ambiguous detection. So I think that we should be a bit more proactive, and I'm a bit against saying that this might be a risky activity because sometimes doing nothing can be as risky as doing something. Um, and we are talking about, for example, climate change or reduction of CO emission. Yeah, we can do nothing and just keep rolling, but every, every ton of CO2 added to the atmosphere is killing people, and it's quantified. There's even a cost for that, and we could do nothing, and there's even a value added to, to this kind of thing. So I'm not sure the safe thing of not doing anything at all is a valid um, scientific approach. And I think, yeah, we should be taking a more proactive, um, um, something, at least the nearby stars, for example, in timescales of 10 years, 20 years, we can send a signal and, and get something back or see some reflected light, some, I don't know, some pinging back, some, something very basic. We don't need to send a, a full philosophical say about life on Earth, just say the prime numbers or something like this. Some beeps like Sputnik did. Um, I think um, we, we should be thinking along these lines. It's not just about sending messages of how wonderful we are, um, but actually doing a scientific experiment, just sending pulses, whatever. Um, to see if we can get some feedback from that. I think it is not being taken seriously enough. In this okay. Case. I'd like to point out that the U.S. government thought Sputnik was a pretty strong message. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, in that light, if, um, if Starshot actually eventuates, um, certainly Proxima B is going to get many opportunities to see bright lights uh, focused in that direction. So there is also interesting aspect on time uh, scale of communications. There are animal studies, any communication, animal communication studies showing that rate of communication depends on the metabolism rate, uh, most probably. So we kind of based our searches on metabolism rate what we have, and we should consider that aliens may have a different metabolism and communication rate. So we are we can actually do this uh, on milli nanoseconds, let's say rate. But what about like years and uh, longer rates? So for bigger species, so that's what we should also probably consider. So studies that uh, look at uh, correlations over very long time periods okay. for a single location on the sky. That's something that large databases and machine learning can incorporate. Oh, OK. Can we pass the mic? Kelly Wright, UC San Diego. Um, I was enjoying the discussion about machine learning and in particular about future surveys. So since next year we have TESS and AWST coming online, what lessons have we learned from things like Tabby Star, and how we could better do you know, future analysis so we're not stuck in looking for exoplanets but also looking for SETI surveys? So I wanted to question to the panel is how do we make the best use of TESS and JW for SETI searches. Who'd like to take that? Lucia. Lucian's raising her hand. Yeah, I, I can just quickly say that the work that we've been do doing with unsupervised learning on Kepler is directly applicable to tests. Um, so that should allow us to not only identify things that are truly strange, um, but pretty easily sift through the data, pull out, you know, for example, things that are not astrophysically totally novel, but are rare in the data set. Um, and so that's certainly directly applicable. Um, JWST, uh, that kind of approach is harder because of the fact that it takes very long integration times to even get a single spectrum. So hence my comment about uh, me being long from this world by the time there's enough data on that. <laughs> um, Tabby? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind um, the lesson that we had for the WTF star and you know how weird it is looking in the you know, regular Kepler long cadence data. And um, then the other very strange thing that came out of studying this star was that uh, it, it tends to dim over very, very long time scales. And this is something that, yeah, we didn't know to look for it. And we would never even thought of looking for, like looking at the data set in that way. Like this is something that, I mean, we hadn't explored at all. And so we just got to really keep these things in mind that, you know, you can find just really peculiar things in data sets that are, you know, not, even if it's not, a, you know, something that, you know, yeah, light curve, but it's, it's kind of just in a, in a very different way. And so. And I'd imagine that you'd be very interested in LSST. Yes. Well. Very much. 
Um, I hope LSSD could write some or kind of would be interested to uh, detect also these vanishing star events or um, because I don't know what's the current plans for transients. Do you know where? Uh, I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, sh we should probably talk about those uh, yeah. offline, but I, I, can, uh, I can tell you at least um, that you made this comment that uh, transient surveys tend to look for things that appear, not mm -hmm. things that go away. Um, it's not so like if it would hap Im happen immediately. Yeah, so one of the things about LSST is that uh, we generate an alert within 60 seconds for everything that changes. So that means not just true transients, it also mm -hmm. means variable objects. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the case of your vanishing stars, um, if you had something that had previously been detected um, and you would have an entire history of the light curve, and let's say it disappears below threshold one night and you don't know whether it's gone away or it hasn't, you would have actually the entire history of the light curve associated with that. Um, and one of the things you'd be able to do as a you know, transient astronomer is to also um, request force photometry on places, so in the sort of flipped version where you have a transient appear, um, you can have forced photometry on the, um, the spot for the previous history of it before it appeared, and the reverse is true as well. So you would then get upper limits on the detectability. Um, so, but if it would happen. Okay, I think <laughs> there's, there's good work that can be done with LSST and all of the other instruments we've been hearing about. And I now have to thank the audience and all of the panel members for a really interesting morning, but it's time for lunch. Thank you.